Today, I've come here to speak about the Amass Project, uh, which is focused, as it says here on the slide, uh, on in-depth attack surface mapping and asset discovery. <clears throat> which uh, I guess it wouldn't hurt to plug right there that um, it's a flagship project for OWASP that addresses a, a part of their portfolio <clears throat> about uh, focused on understanding the attack surface before you can jump into things like application security, right? It's kind of difficult to be testing your application security if you aren't sure where the applications are or they could be... Um, yeah, if you if you if you're not sure where they exist or whether they're um, externally facing or not, and things like that. All right, moving on. Oh, let's see. There we go. <clears throat> so, what was I going to cover? I was going to do a little introduction of um, my to myself, or just how did, how did I get here? What you know, what what brought me to this uh, project in this world? Um, details about the Amass project a demonstration of how you can use it, a little bit about how does this fit into attack surface management and just where are we gonna take it from here? Where are we thinking of bringing the project? And then just opening up the floor, honestly, whatever people wanna uh, ask about or discuss that's related to this is fine with me. <clears throat> yeah, so why, why am I doing this? Or <laughs> why do I feel so uh, passionate about this? So I've been doing this kind of work for about 20 years, it's probably getting to be more than that. Honestly, I'm, I feel like I'm losing count a little bit, but um, it wasn't exactly, well, I'll, I'll get into some of the details of what brought me here. For, currently, those 20 years have been filled up with a lot of uh, research and development, um, security assessment, or like offensive security work. And attack surface management is now like what I've been focused on for the last five or six years. I'm currently uh, the vice president of attack surface protection at ZeroFox. That, that's a rather new uh, role I just took on. Before that, I was the global head of attack surface management at Citigroup. Um, before those two positions, these things were, you know, become as far as uh, how these roles relate to attack surface management, they get a little more vague or hard hard to see the connection sometimes because people weren't even calling this attack surface management. For instance, when I was um, at National Grid, but we actually did create an, an attack surface management program uh, within uh, vulnerability engineering. <clears throat> Originally, it was actually part of uh, threat intelligence, then it moved to vulnerability engineering. And uh, before that, I was uh, doing, like I said, cyber warfare research and development. I was identified as the subject matter expert for that within North of Grumman. I also was the director of their penetration testing program. And before I was in, in that role, I just did a lot of, uh, I'll just call it cyber uh, research for the Air Force Research Laboratory and other parts of the government. But you, okay, so you can find me at all these various places I have listed down here. Feel free to, you know, look me up on Twitter or Mastodon or Discord. Honestly, Discord is probably the easiest way to get a hold of me if, if you'd like to ask about this. All right. So, yeah, I, I included a couple slides just to um, paint the picture of like, why did I? start looking at this, why, why am I so interested in this um, area of security? Why do I believe we need to be doing something about it? So uh, when I first got in involved in the world of information technology, I was just a computer science student, right? I, I actually had no um, desire initially to be involved in security. I was, uh, focused on network programming, telecommunications. I was just honestly kind of obsessed with the internet and the ability to reach across the globe uh, from your desk. So that's what I was pursuing at university. Uh, while I was there though, I worked for the university as a network uh, administrator. 
And what I ended up doing was <clears throat> I realized I was able to automate my job. So I ended up automating every single task, literally, of my job to where they were paying me. But like I, I didn't have to do anything if I didn't want to. And so I, I think I just felt guilty. And I, I said to the assistant director, uh, you know, I have this whole job automated. So maybe you have a couple more things you can have me do. Um, and he said, well, we have these security policies and we have no way to detect if they're being violated, no way to enforce them. So it'd be nice to, you know, maybe if you're so good at automating things, you could, you could do that for me. And so I took on a couple of, um, the, you know, those challenges and we ended up finding all sorts of violations and to the point where some of these students, uh, I think were expelled for what they were doing. But it was a bit of an eye-opening experience because it showed me, first of all, this is all quite doable. Um, you know, this automation of monitoring, detecting violations, noticing if people are, you know, going outside of terms of terms of use and things like that. And I liked it. And it <clears throat> seemed like people needed it really bad. So it kind of threw me in the direction of information security. I ended up getting my first job, a full-time job at least, um, developing cyber warfare capabilities. So one of the projects uh, that's very related to this project is this, uh, this one where we made it so network reconnaissance tools could evade intrusion detection, which was kind of a big deal at the time because a lot of people thought, oh, well, we can, we can see when these things are happening, so we're not too worried about it. But by making it so that now these reconnaissance tools could operate and were not detectable, it was kind of a big deal, at least that back then. This was in the early 2000s. And so continuing with that, uh, you know, once I kind of moved away a little bit from R&D, uh, my career went in the direction of uh, red teaming, penetration testing, vulnerability assessment. And honestly, I think it's just because there was a lot of attention being drawn to this. There was a lot of money in it. And since I was already doing offensive security work for years, uh, the companies just kind of said, well, this seems like something you should take care of. <laughs> so, um, so I ended up mentoring people uh, to be able to do this. I ended up managing teams that uh, perform these functions. But what was interesting about it is back when I was doing R&D, you know, as you can imagine, you kind of sit in the lab and you're not always seeing what's going on in the operations or what's taking place in the field. I feel like when I started doing the um, security assessment work, it really was an eye-opening experience to just how bad <laughs> the situation was with um, how customers weren't aware of their attack surface or their exposure on the internet or what assets were even reachable, right? Like you, I guess my experience with the military was they were somewhat on top of this, right? Like they, they knew the battlefield is, you know, the way I think they would describe it, but working with commercial customers, I noticed this was, the opposite. It was, you know, it's quite the opposite. They usually were not aware of a large percentage of their exposed assets. And so when I noticed how well we could do, we could haunt these things down and then work with customers to help them understand where they were exposed and they didn't realize it, it kind of created like a niche for us. We started focusing heavily on uh, red teaming with open source intelligence, you know, using open source intelligence uh, we combined that with doing adversary emulation based on the adversaries that were actually targeting these industries and things like that. And it, you know, it allowed us, allowed us to say, well, these findings are more focused on what you need to be aware of, right? It was the discoverability of the assets plus the exploitability, plus if threat actors could actually exploit these targets, now you have a way to prioritize your risk or do risk prioritization. And, um, you know, this worked worked pretty well. People were interested in this because 
they like the idea that you're not just giving me a big pile of vulnerabilities that I have where I have no idea what to, you know, how to prioritize this or what to work on first. It was, you're telling me exactly what I need to be worried about. And I can start allocating resources intelligently to this. So that worked out pretty good for a while. But like I said, this um, trend I was noticing where I was seeing the S inventories were stale. They didn't, you know, they oftentimes were, honestly, they just weren't being maintained, you know, is what it seemed like. Or there were, I noticed a lot of companies had project teams that were simply creating um, exposed assets that, and they weren't going through the proper channels to, um, you know, get permission to put these things out on the internet in the name of, they wanted to get their, you know, meet their milestones and deadlines earlier. So they just didn't want to go through the red tape, you know, deal with the red tape and things like that. But some of the companies I dealt with uh, and, you know, I showed them what their, uh, exposure looked like from an attacker's point of view and then said, so what does this look, you know, how does this compare with what you were, you know, what your inventory and your re registries are telling you, you know, they'd say, this is only set, you know, we only knew of 75% of these. Some of them even said 50% or a couple said lower numbers than that, which <laughs> seems almost unbelievable, but, but it's true. And, and some of these customers had mature you know what were considered mature security programs you know where they were investing a lot of money into these programs it wasn't just you know these small companies that couldn't afford to try to um do their due diligence it was it was a serious problem that seemed to be affecting everyone all right so the the point of this little story uh hopefully is that you see i came from a world where I, you know, in warfare, they tend to be on top of what's taking place on the battlefield. As I moved more into the commercial space, it seemed like this wasn't happening. And it was obvious to me that if we could help people with this, there would be great benefits uh, to these customers. Because again, if you can reduce discoverability, you can reduce exploitability. Well, I guess a good point, a good um, thing to say here is people already worry about exploitability, right? We have vulnerability management programs and things like that. People are concerned about threat actors. They they monitor or watch um, threat intelligence feeds, but they don't often understand discoverability or what is reachable. And I think that that was kind of the missing piece in this equation for a lot of these companies. All right, so the Amass project was born. <clears throat> so what is this? So at this point in time, it's a flagship OWASP project. It, um, and like I said at the beginning, it's focused on in-depth attack surface mapping and asset discovery. But of course it wasn't always <laughs> uh, OWASP flagship project. It actually started as my little project to, so I, I said a moment ago that I, I started working with more and more customers to help them see uh, this, say, problem that they had. But honestly, it was kind of a lot of work doing this manually. Uh, it was starting to eat, eat up a lot of my time. And I figured, you know, going back to my history of uh, being able to automate things pretty well, I figured, well, let's automate this. You know, let's make this easy uh, to do in the background. <clears throat> so, yeah, and instead of sit here and, um, well, for instance, perhaps some of you have used things like Multigo, right, which is a, is a nice investigative tool. Uh, it can help you dig up similar kinds of information, especially if you, say, equip it with uh, the access to the right data sources and things like that. It's a nice tool um, for interactive use, I would argue, right? Or at least that's in, in my experience using it. It was great if you were like an investigator or an analyst and you were sitting down in front of it and working with it, then it was, it was excellent. But if your goal was, well, I just want to fire this off and then go 
spend time with my family or something like that. And you want to come back to a treasure trove full of details about a target's attack surface. Uh, personally, Maltico wasn't really the tool for me at least. So, and I didn't really discover any other tools out there that quite uh, did the job, you know, fit the bill. There were some tools out there to help, but, you know, it felt like not any one of them gave you the, like say complete enough picture. So I just figured, well, let's, let's create this for myself so that I can make this easier for, for working with these customers. And that way I can come to every single meeting with them, uh, with the data, uh, and be able to discuss this with every single customer I was working with. When I finally showed this to a couple of people or, or when people said, well, how did you get this? Or, you know, how did you dig this up so easily? Um, you know, they convinced me that the, the community needs this, right? And they didn't have to twist my arm exactly. I already noticed this from all these companies I was working with that had the same problem they were dealing with. And I noticed something's got to be done about it. I wasn't sure if giving this tool away initially was the right choice, but then the more I thought about it, I was like, well, let's just make this easier for everybody. Let's raise the bar. We'll make it so that people who previously thought this was too difficult to do, or they didn't have the say skill set to do it or the right people to work on it. Let's just make it turnkey so that now it's easy and we'll see what happens. And it seemed to kind of work. <laughs> so that's exactly what this does, right? It, it um, project is focused on attack surface mapping, but one, of course the thing that comes out of the project that everyone likes the most, uh, I would say, is this tool that you can use that now has been, from what I understand, you know, from what I keep seeing, it seems like people all across the world are using it both uh, individual practitioners and you know companies that are uh, using this on the back end or like in an automated fashion and out of the box if you if you go download this tool um, there's like over a hundred different data sources that it can leverage for you not necessarily all immediately some of them require you uh, setting up accounts to get access to the data but the tool is codified to interact with all these data sources so that you can either use them the data sources for free or you can uh, provide the credentials to the tool and then it will just go get what it needs for you so it, it really does kind of make this turnkey on top of that if you have other data sources perhaps specific to your organization or or just things you know about that this project hasn't um, gotten around to adding, you know, creating an implementation for, you can create your own implementation. You can expand it yourself because it's scriptable and it's pretty easy, I would argue, to add additional functionality. Because it's all based on this engine that is just interacting with these scripts and anybody can, can write their own scripts and people do. You know, I hear uh, stories all the time from people saying, oh, well, we have um, our own like data in bulk sitting around and we just wrote a script to access and make use of that as well. Or some people I think, you know, have told me they include data from their um, CMDBs and inventories and things like that because they want the additional insight brought into um, what the tool puts into the database and things of that nature. If you want to learn more about uh, the project or something I haven't covered tonight, uh, these would be great links to go to. One of them is the project page, which I'll admit probably needs uh, to be brought up to speed a little bit or up to date. The GitHub repo is really kind of where all the action uh, is happening as far as the uh, the tool is concerned, or at least where where the say issues are being posted, the development is taking place, obviously things like that. But if you just want to land somewhere and ask questions about this tool or get knowledge from people who are used to using it, I would say 
Discord is actually your best friend because that Discord server is pretty active. There's usually a good number number of people on it. Um, a lot of people there are quite savvy with this tool and familiar with using it. So I'd say there's a really good chance that if you're just having trouble with it or something like that, you'll get your question answered quicker if you go to Discord than if you say, put an issue up on GitHub or something like that. All right. Let's see here. So I guess I kind of explained this, but I'll, I'll make sure I didn't miss anything. Uh, why did we create it, right? Well, like I said, it's because there was clearly a gap uh, in, in security related to understanding your attack surface. But more specifically, there was no existing uh, capability that gave me what I needed, right? We needed a more comprehensive capability. Um, five years ago, the only, the only thing I was able to find in this area were like hacker tools, right? And not that this, I mean, some people do view this as a hacker tool, but the goal of when, when I wrote this really was to start creating something that blue teams would use. So I'm sure there's people cringing right now or hate that I'm saying that, but it's the truth. This was developed so that companies could get better visibility on their attack surface. It just happened to work out that uh, other communities like the bug bounty community um, managed to make good use of it as well. But it, it wasn't designed for bug bounty hunting. I mean, I'm glad that it's uh, served other communities very well. I hope everybody can make, you know, make use of this. But it really was designed for working with like security programs or like bring this uh, visibility to a security program. So since nothing quite did the job at the time, that's why this was fired up. Um, and it's it's an active project. That's the other thing. A lot of these other projects, someone created it, they got it working, and then it just kind of sits there. This project, ever since it was released, has been actually only growing in activity. There's lots of contributors, lots of people um, using it. And we're we always have more to do <laughs> than we have time to do uh, with this project. There's always more work to get done than we can possibly get done. I'll have more more to talk about, more to say about that later. So the other thing too is sim almost similar to the Maltigo situation. A lot of these say hacker tools that were out there um, five or six years ago. They're in, they were interactive or meant for interactive use. And it just kind of seemed like, well, this wasn't the point of, of why I wanted to build a mass. It was to create the automated solution, as I said earlier, that you could just walk away from and then come back and it would um, have finished for you. Well, why, why would you need to do that? But another major difference between these other tools and the MS tools, the way I viewed how this needed to get done was with this recursive enumeration process. A lot of the tools that existed back then, if not all of them, and some that are still in use today, they're not recursive. They, they just go pull the data down from somewhere and print it out. But if you really want to get as a, the most complete picture possible of uh, an organization's attack surface, this is a very cyclic or recursive process where you have to be able to take the findings, put them back into the data pipeline and re review the new information like you're starting all over again, right? It's like this constant flow of, we found more, now consider everything all over again. We found more, consider those things all, you know, as well. And you just have to keep doing that until there's nothing left to review. It takes longer to do that which is why you need something that's just gonna keep churning on it when you walk away and continue with your life. And that's what a mass does. Uh, the other thing is it's uh, the MS tool saves all this. And I don't just mean in like a file, but it's in a database. So a lot of these other tools, they just print the findings out or they print it to like a text file or something. But the MS uh, project saves the discoveries and then the next time you run the tool against the same target, it uses everything it knew from previous engagements with your current engagement. So 
Why is that important? Uh, it means anything you've done, you've invested time into doing before or anything you knew about before is going to definitely be considered in the current engagement, which means you're gonna have more consistency as you do with these engagements again and again and again. And when you get, when the results show differences, you can assume, well, it knew everything that we knew before. So if there's something not there now, then it means it's probably gone. Or if something new showed up, it should mean it's because we didn't know about it before and we found it and we should check it out and pay attention to it. As opposed to it just possibly meaning that maybe uh, you got lucky one time when you ran the tool and another time you didn't, right? Which is what can happen with these other tools. You can get inconsistencies uh, between executions. Also, it just makes it easier to use the data, honestly, right? I mean, if you have it in a database and you can just say, tell me what we know right now or tell me what we found last time, it makes it much easier to do that. All right. So just like a quick little, I guess you could say tease or, or getting to the point a little bit. Um, this is kind of what it tends to look like, at least if you're watching it run, is you get this um, output that kind of like streams as it's running, where it says, from this data source, we found out about this name, and these are the IP addresses that it that resolved to. And when it's all done, it says, and here are the ASNs they were found within. You know, it will say down here, this ASN, we found four names, and they were in this net block, which is kind of nice. That summary information can be helpful just to give you an idea of where does this organization organization exist on the internet? You know, where, where have they put most of these assets? And it can start to help you get an idea of what you would want to do next if you were going to dig further into, say, the exploitability of the targets and things like that. But honestly, I just include included this to help anyone who's never used this before get a quick idea of well, what does it tend to look like when you're running it. Um, for a little bit, little bit more detail as to what exactly does it do. <clears throat> Over the years that we've been developing it, uh, we've kind of broken it down into these like five different sub commands or functions that it, it uh, currently performs. One is what we call the Intel subcommand, which honestly um, is probably the one I don't like <laughs> the most. Uh, because it's the one that kind of requires manual interactive use. It's the one, uh, it's the place where we put capabilities or features when it requires a human to be involved or like analysis, further analysis to be done before that data gets included into the, the completely automated process, which is the enumeration uh, subcommand. Eventually, my goal would be to be able to say, well, we don't need any, any feature of this tool to require a human in the loop. So we wouldn't even need that uh, subcommand potentially. <clears throat> but for now, there's still some uh, stages of this work that can require uh, a human to make decisions about whether the information is in scope of the target which I'll show later. Uh, so yes, there's the enumeration um, subcommand. That's definitely the one that we invest the most time into, which is being able to find more and more of these assets. Uh, there's the database access. So being able to take everything that's been collected and for instance, like generate JSON files that include all the details of everything we, you know, everything we found out about the targets or the assets. The, the ability to track the changes from one um, execution of the, you know, from, um, from one time, well, forgive me. <laughs> you, can, you can use tracking to either say, between these two times that we ran this tool, what changed between that? Or you could just say, compared to everything we knew before about this. It could be 
based on you know 50 different times that you've done this before you could say just tell me what's different uh with the latest version you know snapshot of the information that we've received so that's the way you'd probably run it by default where it just says these are new things that popped up that we didn't know before these are things that moved from where they were before <clears throat> things like that and then uh, one of my favorite uh functions of the or features of this tool is the visualization uh, which allows us to not just print text out about this but actually kind of see it um i guess the reason i think this is really useful is because i i find it so much easier to identify odd assets when they're literally mapped out for you and you can kind of see that it's an outlier or it's all on its own uh it doesn't look like it's part of the say structure that the company has um is following for most of the other assets so that that's a pretty powerful capability and i'll show it later so the the point here like i said is that the tool drives the mass engine to perform this work for uh users like i said earlier uh trying to make this as turnkey as possible but also make it so then the findings become usable or you know makes it hopefully pretty easy for users to um, leverage the findings or the discoveries so that's what we're trying to do here <clears throat> i mentioned i think a little bit earlier that you know this is this is a cyclic process so what does that look like i, I threw it in here to provide a clarification on that so it, it starts with i would say what a lot of other tools out there um, have tried to do in the past, which is just kind of reach out to a bunch of places and say, what can you tell me about this uh, organization or this target? And then it brings it back, right? And, and kind of say, sorts it. And, and uh, a lot of these other tools just print, print it out. But in this case, we collect that almost like a trampoline stage or like a starting point to say, let's find out what everybody else is willing to tell us about this and then we'll move forward from there and um so then it brings so that's what collecting information about the assets is, is it, it's for instance going out to say who is xml api or your favorite you know service provider that provides this kind of data and saying tell us what you've worked hard to uh discover or know you know learn about this target domain or organization and we bring that back step two though is uh we validate all those findings right so instead of just <clears throat> blindly saying oh great thank you and then printing it out uh we check that it's still there right <clears throat> make sure that it's it's actually still out there so that's what uh step two is all about but it it also gives us more information about where these assets are so instead of just saying oh well i know there's something out there with this name or something like that now we can say and it's over here and what that does for us is it allows us to continue our process and look in those places for more things right it gives us like um almost like leads right that we can then pursue and dig deeper which is why this tool is called in-depth attack surface mapping so once we have though i'll call it those locations or places on the internet where these things exist uh, we can apply other methods right where we can well for the ones that i have listed here is an obvious one would be try brute forcing for for more names or try crawling the websites at those locations looking for more names um yeah po polling from tls certificates is a, is a great uh way to find more names but these are all things that you can do once you have starting points you can say let's go there and see what else we can find but um that's those are the one that's what i would call active methods where it requires reaching out and uh say touching the target right <clears throat> which is optional you don't have to do that with a mass, you can turn it off, or it's off by default. 
but you can turn it on and it definitely gives you more um, results. For instance, like another typical example would be uh, we can do zone zone transfers and things like that to try to pull as much data as possible from the target. But we can also use the, say, network information to say, well, let's just check more um, addresses that are close to where the, where the uh, assets are located. We'll look for more of them. Maybe additional ones will show up. So we call that sweeping. Um, we also can just do uh, scraping of the web pages and things like that. And um, reverse DNS queries. There's, there's just lots of ways that we can say, based on not a name, but an address or a location, let's see what else the internet will tell us about this target. And all of this just feeds back into the beginning where it's like now we've got all these new names, all these new locations, and we can just start start the process all over again. And it definitely goes on for quite a while depending on the size of your target. And I mentioned a little while ago, um, when it's done and you have all this data, uh, it can be fun to look at. I don't know, maybe it's just me. I think it's fun to look at. <laughs> but um, it, it's interesting to see how, honestly, a lot, a lot of these organ organizations just end up looking very similar because they're using similar services or, or infrastructure. And like I said, it can make it easy once you've been using this the visualization for a while to see when something seems odd or like an anomaly. So more more on that. Um, so Real quick, Jeff, it's Guy. So that go back to that. That looks really interesting. It's kind of like mind mapping when you're doing uh, work. So can you click on like to the right, like uh, the green or, or the yellow and double click on those and maybe you could show that in the demo and we'll tell you instantly what, who, what and where that is. Right, so I can't hear because of course this is just a, uh, an image, but yes, um, these are these nodes. You can like mouse over them, and cool. as you can see here, it will tell you. So, what is it? Where did you find? Where did we uh, find it? <clears throat> and you can like move these around, right? And and you can these um, edges tell you things like what type of um, like DNS record revealed this or. For instance, these ones that say contains, it just gives you, it lets you know that this IP address is inside of this net block. So you can triage here. real quickly then. Cool. That That's excellent. All right. I don't want to interrupt you and you could go, you know, move on to the demonstration, but that's really, <laughs> that, that's good for, like you said, like for a blue teamer, right? Who, what happens is they, you know, they're, they're getting in. Uh, a bunch of information and they got to see what's a false positive or not. Right. And so they can triage quickly and th their job is hard enough. So that, that, that's really cool. I could see where you blue timbers can use this. But, all right, go ahead. I'm going mute. No, it's a good question. Feel free to ask. Um, yeah. And I have, and, and remind me if I forget, uh, I have more to say about what you were just talking about later when I talk about future directions. All right, so the demonstration, what I want to say before I just jump right into it is uh, what exactly am I going to try to show you or so you can kind of follow along or make sure I don't lose you. <laughs> um, so th this tool is definitely I, I think it's been said by many people it's a Swiss army knife kind of tool right there's there's a lot it can do. And um, you know users have come to us and said, honestly, this is a complex tool. It, where do I begin? So, so it's, there's a, there's a lot going on with it. And um, it can, it can make it so that you kind of have to have different phases to um, your say process or workflow using it. So what I'm going to try to cover is I'm going to show you a little bit about the intelligence features, even though I told you, I wish we didn't need them, but um, I'm going to, I guess, give you a couple tricks on how you can, start your attack surface uh, mapping by leveraging these uh, features. Then I'll show you uh, the enumeration process, which honestly is fairly simple. I'll just show you some of the options um, that exist. I mean, it can be complicated if you're trying to maximize on everything that this tool can do for you, but it also can be very easy to get started with it. 
And then um, I'll show you how we can track changes, uh, report findings, and visualize the results, which hopefully we'll have enough time for that. <laughs> but let's see what we can do. So um, I think I'm going to have to at least stop the screen sharing so that I can share a different screen. So let's hope that that works out. So you'll have to probably look, give me an idea of how well you can see it if I need to make it bigger, which I imagine I probably will need to. All right, I'm um, 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 your eyes out here. Okay, so that's, so, um, that looks good. Um, yeah. I can make it smaller if it, if it fits better. Well, um, it looks good. I mean, let me look, uh, people are just, uh, let me see what they're saying. Looks good. Yeah, looks good. All right. So one thing that people usually ask me is, <clears throat> what if I have nothing to go on about this company other than a company name, right? And actually, I wish I could say I had a, a perfect answer for you that this tool will just do everything for you. And eventually I will. <laughs> but um, right now, company name is not actually part of the data model for this tool. It's on the horizon. Um, you kind of have to do some of this legwork yourself still when you are um, getting started with this. And I guess what that kind of means is you, ha you have to get to a point with this tool where you can seed the tool with the data about the domain names that are part of the namespace for this organization. Uh, it, it won't just do all of that for you yet. <clears throat> so what, I'll, what I wanted to do is show you two ways that you can uh, attempt to do that, uh, either using this tool or also some other uh, techniques that are out there that could be helpful. <clears throat> the first one I was going to show is actually, um, so the, the most recent place I'm aware of where this technique was demonstrated, I think was in Naham Sek's uh, recent video that he released on, I think it was like part of his attack surface management series, I believe he called it. And let's see here. So there's a lot in here, <clears throat> but what he demonstrated is you can curl the uh, CRT.sh and give it an organization name and say, give me the uh, JSON for this. Now, actually, I'll start this by pick a different, easier target, something smaller so I can, I had fun looking at a couple different places. <clears throat> so if I, if I just do this, right, and just let it print it out, luckily this is a small target, right? So it won't be too bad. <clears throat> but what I wanna show you is it gives you more than you actually want. There's a, there's a lot in here, right? And we can clean it up a little bit. Um, so I'm wondering, as you, you start doing that, do you have um, the capability to throw it into like a, a reporting structure for report? Or that, you well, know, for this right here, or what yeah, I'm you, showing? Yeah, well, you can use that for a report, actually. Man. Yeah. I was looking at that big, that big list of that of uh, that you had in there, the name value and all that stuff. Not before and all that. Yeah, that. But that's right. Better. So the, what this is, is this is simply the same data, only it's just been made like pretty. So it's it's been printed pretty, is what uh, they call it, JSON print pretty. And uh, that's what the default behavior of this JQ tool is. If you just send it the JSON, it will just print it back out, but in a way that's you know, more pleasant to, to read. But what you'll see here is uh, this is a boring target, right? <laughs> because all the common names are pretty much the same. Like 
there's actually nothing to be obtained from one of these rec, uh, certificates or another, you know, they are, they're all giving the same name. So it's, it's not a, a very exciting target, but it still allows us to demonstrate what I want to show you, which is if I, uh, so if I were to do that again, but what I say is take out the um, hyphens, or the sorry, asterisks, uh, wildcards here, and <clears throat> and then just print out the unique domain names. Uh, you can do that with this like one liner right here, where we're getting the the JSON, we're sending it to JQ, we're saying just give us the common names which is, as you can see here, it's just the part we were interested in. Get rid of the wild cards and then make sure we're just getting the root uh, domains. Like we don't, we don't want the uh, subdomains and things like that, which will show up in here if you're getting a larger target. And then it prints out just the unique root domain names. So as you can see, that's what we got. We got just OWASP.org since that's the only name that appeared in here. Um, out of all these records, you can do something similar <clears throat> um, with a larger target like Sony. <clears throat> and of course, you're going to get a lot, a lot more names. Uh, now, the, the weakness, say, of this uh, approach is that it's only giving you the names that it found from certificates, right? So it's, it's just one, say, slice or one um, part of internet infrastructure where these names can show up. <clears throat> it's definitely not the whole picture. It's a really valuable resource and it certainly will give you a lot of um, a lot of good names, <clears throat> but it won't necessarily give you the maximum amount that you can you can find. Yeah, maybe I maybe I picked something too big here because <clears throat> this is taking a little longer than I had hoped. Hey, will this find all your expired certs? Um... Oh wow, look at that! Something went wrong with it. <clears throat> but um, expired certs. Uh, well, cert, uh, srt.sh can find, or you know, you can tell it include historic or expired certs, and uh, it will show you those. Yeah, that that. That right there, companies need immediately. <laughs> I, I don't know, Phil. Um, do you find that when you're doing your uh, recon? Yeah, a lot of times during pen tests, that's one of the things oh my we God. find through vulnerability scans is all sorts of SSL related stuff <laughs> or TLS. Yeah, that that's important, you know, because a lot of times um, certain researchers will just, oh yeah, I found a bunch of expired search. Well, well can I get the list? Uh, uh, you, you you didn't at least take a picture of it off the screen. <laughs> but but the downside to the pen testing part is if you're doing traditional pen testing, and maybe you're not doing OSINT past a few hosts that are in scope, you may miss a lot of things that have expired certs. Correct. Whereas taking the attack surface management approach, you're more likely to find those type of issues. Yeah. No. Most def. Yeah. All right. Sorry to railroad. So what you. I was gonna. <laughs> No, it's, it's it's definitely fine. <clears throat> so anyway, I, I guess unfortunately it didn't want to uh, print out all the uh, Sony uh, names, but it's it's not really necessary. The point being, if it did, it would it would give us probably thousands of names, um, and just the unique root domain names. But as we saw with uh, OWASP, it didn't really give us much, right? It gave us just the one domain name. Not that OWASP is using an awful lot of domain names, but actually it does have more. And um, what I was gonna say is let's let's see what we can find using a different method. So this is what you can do if you just wanna go to this um, you know, website essentially, uh, ask it to tell you what it can about an organization's certificates and then pull the names out. <clears throat> but the MS project can also use other types of data 
through the uh, Intel subcommand. So what I'll do is first, let's just take a look at what does it say we can do with this, or, or at least the parts that I would recommend you uh, take a look at. One is, the one I'm gonna show you right now is this who is option, which really it's actually reverse who is, is what it's doing. So if you have the correct data sources that support this, that's the key that there's really um, not that many good data sources for this, but if you have access to them and the credentials for those uh, say APIs are in your mass configuration, it will do this for you and it can come up with a lot of names. So before moving ahead with other features here, let me show you what this can look like or what, what this could give us. So if I include <clears throat> my configuration, let's see here. which has a lot of credentials in it. And I say, I wanna do who is, and I wanna do it for OWASP.org, because that's the only uh, name, or that's the only domain name we have right now for this target, right? It's the only one that's shown up with what I demonstrated so far. So if I do this, it will attempt to, uh, perform the reverse, well, it doesn't perform the reverse who is, uh, who is, it goes out to the data sources that it can utilize that support reverse who is, or, or they have reverse who is data available, and they'll allow you to query them for the additional associated names. So, <clears throat> so that's what we're getting here is we're getting additional domain names that are supposed to be, let's, let's cross our fingers and hope they're related or associated with OWASP.org. So we, we see a couple that, you know, I imagine we would be willing to believe uh, pretty easily like OWASP.com. And let's see, we've got some AppSec, uh, you know, domains. That's probably fairly believable that they're related. Um, honestly, I don't, think I know if pythonsecurity.org is definitely <laughs> um, OWASP, but it certainly seems relevant. So so if you want, we wanted to know for sure, we would have to dig into these a little bit and, and validate them ourselves because there's nothing preventing one of these data sources from attempting to fulfill your request and then giving you false positives or something like that. So but for now, I would say- Getting off the who is? Um, or what is it connected somehow with OWASP.org or w where is like modeltime.com coming from? Where, where does it get that information from or Blockster? How, how is it getting? Right, so, un so unfortunately, at this point in time with the Amass project, there's no way for me to take what it just printed out and say how and then show you or answer you properly. Okay. That's something I'm going to talk about later. Okay. Um, but the way that this tends to be, uh, be performed is companies that collect all the who is information, right? So they're, they're trying to collect as much of it as they can possibly get. And they have it in a, like a data store somewhere are then saying, well, let's find commonalities across the records that give us the feeling that these all belong to the same organization, or they were all registered by the same organization and there's different ways they can do that they can uh, compare you know they can compare the company name in it they could compare the people that are put down as um you know the the pocs and things like that for the who is they can use things like domain uh name servers <clears throat> that are used by or that are in the record so there's there's some things they can search for and say well, if, if they have the same information in them as OWASP.org did, then we can feel comfortable that there's some kind of association here and they're probably related. So that's what they do. And then they make it easy for people like us to say, so here's the, the record, you know, here's the, the domain name I know about and I'm, I'm interested in. Tell me more about, or, you know, tell me the asso associated names based on what you have in your data store of 
the ones that are related to each other. So they do all the, the heavy, you know, the heavy lifting for you and then make it easy for you to look these things up. And that's why you're paying them for the data. Anyway, I wanted to demonstrate this because I get a lot of questions from people saying, well, if I'm at ground zero and I have no idea about this company, where, where do I get started? How do, how do I get the ball rolling? Um, and this is how you, how you can do that. Now, I, uh, I constantly try to tell people, well, I'm vendor agnostic. I, I don't want to point people at any particular um, company for this. But inevitably, when I tell them, oh, well, you need the right data source to do this, they usually say, well, which ones do you recommend? Like uh, you probably already heard me say earlier, <clears throat> I think who is XML API is a really great uh, data source for this. Uh, security trails, you know, is a, is a good uh, data source for this. I think a lot of people use, um, I, I know I'm not going to pronounce it right, but it's it's who XY, I believe is, is the name of the company. Um, they're very good at this. So there, there's a handful of these companies that, um they've been doing this for years and they definitely do it better than other you know most other companies so i would say if you if you're looking to invest in one of these you know i would pick one of those three probably to get the ball rolling and um of course do your own homework and you can decide for yourself uh which one you feel is better for your use or your needs so another thing you can do with Intel, but it actually requires that we we move forward from this before we can leverage it. But I'm going to show you the uh, feature right now, or or the flag at least. Is once we have more information about where is our target located, such as the ASNs that their assets show up in, or the CIDR ranges. There's features of this uh, subcommand where we can take the data we have about these uh, ASNs and CIDRs and say, <clears throat> go looking for more root domain names in those areas. But again, the reason this is under Intel is because you have to do this carefully. You have to make sure that if you're going to do this, you, for instance, if you're going to give it a CIDR range <clears throat> or, or an ASN value, you really should be pretty sure that it belongs to the target organization and, and it only contains their on-prem resources if you are trying to get their domain names back. Otherwise, if you end up doing this and uh, the, you know, the ASN you give it is actually, say, Amazon.com or something like that, you're going to get thousands of names back and most of them will have no, absolutely nothing to do with your target <laughs> that you're investigating. So. You have to do this carefully in order to make sure you're getting the uh, accurate information back. So what I would say is right now we have this uh, list, right? We could take all of these if, if we're com comfortable using them. We could grab all of them and include them in our initial enumeration. I'm not going to because I want to save us time and, and be able to do this pretty quickly. But if if your goal was, let's start with everything we can find out, we're going to keep looking, right? We're going to keep uh, trying to find more and more. What you would do is put all these into a file and include them in your initial enumeration. And also, don't of course, don't forget OWASP.org, which got us here. <clears throat> but this, this is your kind of starting point. Where we'd go next is the enumeration, which if I show you uh, the health information for this is even more extensive than Intel because th this is the, the most developed part of the tool. It's, it's where it's doing, you know, the heavy lifting for you. And like I said, you can walk away and find other things to do while it's uh, doing the in-depth tax surface mapping. So there's a lot you can do with this, but also you don't necessarily need to, to get started. So I'll, I'll show you what I mean by that. If we say we just want to see the sources and the IP addresses for the names that are discovered, and we're and like I said to, to save time, let's just use OWASP.org. 
that can be your command right there. I mean, you could actually take out the IP and the source. You could just say enum, and here's the domain I want to learn more about. And what you're telling it is you're saying, so now tell me all the all the other assets or all the other names that exist within that name. So that's why we want to try to get as many of these root domain names as possible. Because of course, if you know the company is using these, then you want to get visibility on, on all these things. So if I fire this off right now, <clears throat> what's going to happen is right, right away, it's going to start using these data sources uh, that it knows about to say, tell me what you know about OWASP.org. It's also going to look at our existing database and say, have we ever done uh, an enumeration for OWASP.org before? or any enumeration that included OWASP.org? And if the answer is yes, then it's gonna take everything we knew previously about it and include it in this enumeration to make sure, we're, again, like I said earlier, we're not missing anything that we learned about previously. And, um, <clears throat> and then it's gonna do what I said earlier when I went over the cyclic process or the recursive process, it's going to start feeding that into the DNS validation process, which I get a lot of questions about how that works or people wanting to know more about, so what is that or, or why do we do it? So some people will be quite familiar with this if you're a bug bounty hunter or someone who's, I, I would say, almost like suffered with this before, <laughs> is if you, so a couple of things. One is if, if you're doing any kind of brute forcing or you're doing a lot of this kind of um, like DNS enumeration, public DNS servers will eventually catch on to what you're doing and they will throttle your activity. So if this is gonna go on for a long time, the problem with that of course is your enumeration is gonna get throttled and it's gonna take for, forever. Uh, or it'll just stop you at some point if your behavior, say, is bad enough. <clears throat> so what, what do we do about that? Um, so we can we can spread out the activity across lots of re resolvers so that uh, from each of their perspectives, right, it looks like, oh, well, we're, we're being quite reasonable in the amount of use that we're demanding. We can also... Um, Oh, but so the problem that comes with that is if you're going to go out and say, tell me about all the public DNS resolvers available so I can maximize on this technique or, you know, method of leveraging as many as possible, there's plenty of like malicious DNS resolvers out there, ones that will come back and <clears throat> they'll say, yeah, yeah, I've heard of that name and here it is. And then they'll give you an IP address to some malicious website to redirect you to or something like that. Some of these are even smart enough that initially when you start using them, they'll tell you the truth, right? Or they'll be, they'll give you the say non-malicious or benign uh, results. They'll wait for you to use it for a while, at which point the system will say, now we're convinced that they're gonna keep using it. And then they'll, it will start feeding you the malicious uh, results. So for a while, the people were trying to deal with like how, how do we filter the you know or, or validate these dns resolvers and make sure we're only using the good ones it's kind of a hard thing to do like i said some of them are smart enough to try to trick you into using them <clears throat> the way that a mass deals with it is we we use all of them but we use them as untrusted meaning we actually don't care what they give back to us they other than did you know about the name so that's the only thing that we leverage by spreading out the activity across all these resolvers is we just say we just want you to tell us if you've heard of this before <clears throat> if the answer is yes we don't use the data that it gave us back we just say thank you and then we pass the same request on to a trusted dns resolver like google or Cloudflare or something like that. So now when the query completes, we can say, now we can trust the, the result or the, the record that we get back. Um, the only 
remaining step after that is to say, okay, great, but we still want to know if it's a wild card result or if it's an actual legitimate result. It's a bit of a technical problem, but uh, a mass does this for you as well. It, it checks to make sure that it's not just hitting on a wild card uh, DNS record. Unless it only the only reason the wild card um, say answer will come through is if the source of the data is trustworthy enough that we can say, well, I don't think that just got made up. Like that's not a brute forcing guess. It's something that it something we learned about from say a website or something where we have some concrete say evidence that this was probably real, <clears throat> and therefore we'll take the answer even if it does match the the wild card but anyway this entire process is managed for you by a mass you don't have to do it yourself you don't have to understand how it works <clears throat> the only thing you have to live with i suppose uh is that it takes a little while to do this and it can cause a mass to be a little slower than some other tools because we're we're using the DNS resolvers at the rate that they tell us they're comfortable with us using them so that this could go on for hours and it will keep running because we're not violating the, um, the way that the resolvers want us to use them. And we're doing that double checking I mentioned where if we get a name that, uh, that appears to be a, a real name, like it exists, within the dns infrastructure then we are checking it again so you could say we're, we're kind of doing extra work but it's to make sure that you're only getting real legitimate dns names not false positives and um like i said and we're making sure that this could go on for a long time and it won't we won't get shut down due to throttling or something like that so um it does that, then, like I said, if you turn on active methods, it will perform those uh, techniques and the whole thing sends all the, the results back through for any new names or new IP addresses or anything like that that we find in order to uh, leverage things like, like I said, uh, sweeping and reverse DNS and so forth. So what we got here is very familiar looking, right? It, it looks very similar to what we saw in my little snapshot or screenshot uh, that I had on a, a slide. So we've got our names that it found, um, the IP addresses that they, they uh, resolved to, some places where they came, you know, where the data came from. Now notice, this is uh, interesting. Notice I didn't turn on brute forcing, but we have a couple places in here where it says, well, this came from brute forcing. It did. It's just that it didn't happen this time. It, it was from the database. It's something that the database entry was pulled in. We validated the name again, but the actual source of the discovery was brute forcing, which didn't take place during this enumeration. But we're still able to leverage our knowledge of the name since brute forcing was performed previously and it found it for us. So we, we said, okay, great. Thanks for telling us about it. We'll double check that it's still there and uh, have a more complete picture of what's going on. Now, what we can do here, once we've collected this is we can say, so like, what, what should I care about from the findings, right? Like you've collected it and now what are you gonna do with it? There's a, there's a couple things we can do with it. One is we could say, well, let's uh, take a look at what changed, right? From one, from the last time we uh, collected this or from all the, the things we know, uh, knew about it previously. <clears throat> so the easiest way to do that actually is just say track, give it the domain name and see what it um, gives us back. So we just say OWASP.org. which tells us that since the last time we looked at it or did this, we lost a few things. 
<laughs> um, so here it tells us this was the last time this was done. Uh, and or, right, this is this was the this period of time or the range of time that the last one was performed, and then this is the most recent one. And it's saying since then we lost three things. Now there's always the chance that the answer is we didn't actually lose three things. It's just that this enumeration didn't find it. Um, so I, I I don't know how much. I tend to not put too much uh, weight or, you know, I don't find removed entries as very interesting. It's when we find new things, I usually say, ooh, that's interesting. We should take a look at that. I also like it when it tells us that things have moved because sometimes things are moving all the time, right? Like in cloud environments, there's assets that are moving all over the place, but in other environments, uh, moving doesn't, necessarily happen a lot <clears throat> so when things do move it can be interesting to know why or make sure we're aware of why this is happening because that's those are the three possible outcomes it's either something was added uh something was removed or something moved so that's what this uh func sub command tells you the other thing we can do here is we can say Similar to what we did earlier with JSON, I can say, uh, let's access the DB, give me the JSON for OWASP.org. And similar to what I did before, I'll say, let, let's make it pretty enough that we can stand to, uh, to look at it. So <clears throat> the, the reason I want to show you this is there's information in this file or in this json output that you can't get from say the output from the tool or or like a, a file that i mean actually there is a json file that it generates when you run this there actually can be data in this json output though from the db subcommand that will not exist in the file that's generated because this is the one where it takes everything from the db and it generates this json as opposed to the file is generated in a streaming like fashion uh when you're executing the tool <clears throat> it's it's kind of like keeping track of what happened in json format but this one is saying this is everything we know about this target and another thing you can pull from this that it just doesn't really exist accurately in any other place um when you're using this tool right now is so for for every single asset they show up here right with the name of it the domain they were they're inside of or within <clears throat> or root domain i should say and then these addresses which of course uh it's nice that they say the cider blocks the asns and they give you the description of the asn just to give you an idea of wh where exactly are these things but i like this so it tells you every source that found the same thing well why, why does that matter because the tag unfortunately will only tell you like the first thing that found it so it says archive so way back you know the way back machine probably found it um or maybe it was common crawl it's hard, hard to say for sure i think they both are considered archive <clears throat> or maybe not this is this is crawl i imagine but that's definitely an archive. So the tag is kind of like, okay, it's it's maybe nice more during um, the execution of the tool, but the sources can be used later to say, well, how many different data sources knew about this? Because if it's only like one or two and <clears throat> in, in there are data sources that have to be paid for, perhaps you'd say, wow, actually the chances of someone else finding this are kind of smaller than I thought. But if it's one of these where you can tell, well, just about anything was able to tell me about this or you know, far too many techniques found the same name, um, it gives you an idea of the likelihood that someone else is gonna find the same thing. <clears throat> and 
and it can contribute to your um, prioritization or way, way of saying, how seriously should I take the exposure of this asset like or the, the likelihood that it will be exploited by a threat actor so that's uh interesting because i'm sure there's something in here maybe where, where where fewer sources found it but actually okay so here's one so this name 20th anniversary.owasp.org was only discovered from alien vault and name alterations where where we basically you could say this means guessing the name <clears throat> and what that actually for this particular one what that means is it it found it by attaching the additional characters onto probably the more typical word of anniversary until it's like oh wow it stumbled on this label interesting and why these techniques can be so powerful, but our alterations is a very powerful technique. So is brute forcing, but they're also expensive to run because it tries so many different, you know, guesses uh, when it's trying to find these names. <clears throat> anyway, the the J, uh, JSON is definitely useful because of you know all the insight. I would say it provides as to what happened during the enumeration. So. The other thing you can do with this, uh, which I show, I demonstrated earlier, or I didn't demonstrate, sorry, I uh, showed it on a slide, is the vi visualization. So, let's see here. So, viz. <clears throat> it's actually pretty easy to use. Um, at least if you're just going to use like the D3 option, some of these other options, what they what they mean is there's other formats we can put this in. Because unfortunately, uh, this doesn't just allow you to say visualize it and then open it for me right now. It, there's not a say graphical user interface for this. So it creates a file that can then be either imported into some other tool or in like the case of D3, we can just open it up in um, a web browser. The only problem being uh, that's probably the one that can handle the fewest number of nodes, whereas things like Multigo or Graphistry are capable of handling tens of thousands of uh, nodes in their graph. So uh, they can visualize larger targets or organizations for you. But we'll try it out since OWASP is a very small target. We can definitely handle uh, visualizing it. So viz, we'll say we want D3, and we'll say org, and um, it generates the file, which now is just sitting here. <clears throat> when I open it, it's going to open up in like Chrome or something like that, and then I'll just have to uh, switch what I'm sharing in order to show it to you. So just bear with me for a moment. So can everyone see that pretty easily? <clears throat> yes. All right. So like I said, small target, as we noticed, it only had 23 or so um, unique DNS names. What we have here, uh, Guy, to answer some of your questions is, so we have a linked uh, graph here, and each of these uh, nodes that have different colors, they're different node types. So you have your domain type or root domain. <clears throat> so there's our OWASP.org. Uh, we have a couple others actually of that color in here, like google.com, uh, sendgrid.net, and cloudflare.com. The reason those are in there is because they, as part of the enumeration process, when we when we find out, oh, this actually resi uh, resides within, say, a cloud environment or something like that, a mass does the work to say, 
oh, interesting, whose is that or what domain, <clears throat> say, owns that? Or more specifically, in this case, for instance, th this um, domain has MX records that point to this, right? So they, it's like an alias saying, well, we actually want you to go here and use this. And then it turns out that it's google.com. So it says, oh, okay. So that's our root domain now for these uh, mail servers. So that, that's how it ends up discovering these things. <clears throat> these don't come out in your say command line output because this isn't really in scope of what you were asking for, right? But it is part of the process that's performed where it finds out about all these things and it's recorded. It's just, um, I guess you could say for most people in the way they use this, it's kind of noise to them. In the future though, and I'll talk about this more later, we do wanna make this kind of data more uh, easier to find or query <clears throat> from this tool. But going ahead, um, so yeah, the purple ones, these are MX or mail servers. This is what you're seeing here is just your typical uh, structure for any company that uses Google Mail, essentially. So you've got your multiple um, mail servers where they all map to several uh, IP addresses that are all on unique net blocks that all go back to Google's AS, which is just their extremely re uh, reliable, redundant architecture that makes sure that you always have your mail working. <clears throat> but uh, there's a couple other things here, right? Like we've got this um, name URL 2008OWASP.org and it ended up mapping to SendGrid and there we go, it's SendGrid's uh, systems out here. We've got Secure Flag, which is a, another project within OWASP, and they seem to have some of their own arc, arc, um, infrastructure, apparently, which is leveraging Amazon cloud services. What else do we have here? We've got name servers, right? So the name servers, the NS records here for for this domain, um, they're in Cloudflare. So that's all this is actually, it's just showing, or at least that's all that these are, are right here. <clears throat> now, the, these of course are the majority of the names that were found. What's kind of interesting about this uh, say target is that, so we saw earlier there were like 29 or something like that domain names, which is what the green ones are, <clears throat> but they only have, six IP addresses. And you can see how big these nodes are, meaning lots of edges going to these nodes. So what you can kind of glean just from looking at this without even like investigating every single one of them is, wow, I've got a lot of names here that all are pointing to the same IPs. Just kind of interesting that that's how they have it set up. And actually, I think if you look at these, you'll see it's, it's like they all are pointing to the same IP six IPs. So it's it's like every single one of these just ha has redundant, you know, they re they resolve to all six of these. <clears throat> and those IPs are within these three net blocks, it would seem. Looks like it. And they're all within Cloudflare. So or being handled by Cloudflare, at least. <laughs> so that's what we we discovered for this one domain name that we investigated. So actually, I think that was the majority of the demonstration, at least. And now I can go back to the slides, unless, of course, someone has a question or wants me to show something real quick, um, since I'm probably also running out of time. What do you think, guys? Uh, Keep moving. Uh, but can I have a I have a quick one? So for internet attack surface innovation, fantastic. So far, so good. Um, how? What's the efficacy for internal networks? So extranets and intranets. Would it still be able to perform similar 
tasks will be able to map the surface similarly or not because there are obviously fewer tools out there repositories of information right so <clears throat> a couple um so first of all and maybe i should have said this earlier uh a mass was never originally designed to do internal attack surface anything honestly and i think part of the reason for that was that at least in my own experience i found this was a much greater problem on the outside than on the inside i mean not trust me i've seen examples since then to um <laughs> of companies that can't even handle their attack surface on the inside either but at least there are ways to for instance there, there's other tools out there that i would argue do a decent job of addressing internal uh, attack surface so i guess i felt like that would have been um developing a tool that when there's already one <clears throat> like bloodhound and th you know things like that but there there were not very good ways of doing it on the outside so th this project so far at least has been strictly for external attack surface uh mapping which i do mention um in my slides but does that answer your question Yeah, yeah, I mean, it does, it does. I'm just, so my frame of reference, and I'll tell you what the scope is, the, for traditional uh, infrastructures, yeah, it definitely works, it, and it's coming out, it's clear. Uh, for cloud infrastructures, for internal, you know, we have hybrid infrastructure these days, right? So everything is hybrid. Um, so I was just trying to, without actually using the tool, which I will, believe me, if not tonight, tomorrow, uh, I was trying to see if you thought about, hey, you know, will this map to infrastructures that are cloud-based or hybrid, um, not necessarily just public-facing, and obviously in those environments there are lots of ephemeral machines. So that that's the background, that's the thought process. Yeah, no, to me it's a perfectly valid point, <clears throat> and luckily, um, now that it's actually a perfect segue because. The attack surface management market definitely understands what you're saying, and they've actually broken <clears throat> the offerings out into several types. And the, for what you're asking about, there, it has its own, say, acronym, because it's kind of a different, a little bit of a different problem or a different kind of offering you have to be capable of. Um, I mean, it, <clears throat> External tech surface management is a different animal than uh, internal, and it's different than when you're trying to get more uh, down in the weeds with applications and things like that. So people want help with all of it, right? And there's different um, types of offerings that are coming out. So for this project, currently at least, and for frankly, most of this uh, the remainder of this talk, I'm just looking at external attack surface management, which is only looking at what's on the internet, so to speak, or outside of your, say, perimeter or what your company has at least management over. <clears throat> or, it, like you said, public facing, I guess, would be the, the best way to describe it. It's for public facing or reachable uh, targets where I don't have, for instance, in order to do with the, uh, to provide additional insight with the cloud resources, the way you were describing it, I would actually have to have say permission to reach in and look inside those environments and then just have the right um you know know how to use the apis accordingly and things like that to ask well what's uh active right now where is it things like that and it, those things can be done <clears throat> and it, it won't necessarily be outside the scope of this project in the future but it's just not uh it hasn't been a priority yet and we just haven't built it in because a lot of people actually like I said maybe I should just move on to the next slide because um I kind of address some of this <clears throat> so what is you know what is attack surface management um again keeping in mind I am definitely looking at this through the lens that I've been looking at it through uh for many years now which is EASM, right? Or external tech surface management. And 
at least for the people I've been supporting and, and helping with this, one of the greatest advantages to doing this is that, and I find this interesting because again, uh, coming from my background with the military, this seemed more like something you would definitely want to ha uh, have access to or be, have, have it be part of your program. The fact that this is now just becoming mainstream is, you know, I find myself still pinching myself about that, but um, it gives you the opportunity to see yourself and your exposure as your adversary would or your enemy would. And I think that's extremely important, right? If you uh, want to understand how you look on the battlefield, so to speak, or, you know, what your risk is on the internet, <clears throat> you have to understand how you would be viewed by um, someone that, like a threat actor. Now, the reason I'm saying this, <clears throat> or the reason I think it has something to do with your question is, when you start uh, mixing that with data that only you would know, because it's internal or it's internal to your cloud account and things like that. Now, now you're kind of making it hazy, like, well, is this something the adversary could see or is it something that only we can, can see? Not that that means we can't include it in the future, it just I think that means we're gonna have to do it in such a way that it's tagged or labeled as, sure, we know about it, but probably only we know about it because we got it from a, a source that uh, was, our own source, as opposed to say something that other people could also get access to. <clears throat> so it starts to get a little interesting when you're trying to manage all this and you're trying to be able to answer the various questions that people wanna be able to ask uh, when you have a program like this in place. Because like I said, it can get confusing when you're starting to mix data that uh, was publicly available or, or like open source intelligence versus things that we had on internal systems <clears throat> or account information and things like that. Or for instance, like internal inventory or CMVD, uh, CMDB data and things like that. Again, I'm not against doing this. I just think it needs to be done carefully so that it doesn't create confusion. And we can still provide the value of seeing through the attacker's lens. <clears throat> Like I said, it also allows you to answer questions like, well, okay, great, you've dumped all this on me, you've shown me all of my attack surface, but how does that help me? Where do I begin? How do I um, you know, perform prioritization on this? It's easier to answer questions like that when you can say, well, since this is what your attacker is most likely to find, and it also happens to be exploitable or something like that, uh, you probably should fix that. <laughs> so that it doesn't end up getting targeted and exploited. <clears throat> Whereas if it's just in a list and the answer is, well, we're not really sure because we don't know, you know, we, we didn't base this on what other people are able to discover. We just based it on the fact that we found it somehow, you know, it, does, it leaves you in the same boat of, well, where do I begin? <clears throat> so I think a lot of people I've helped with this really value the additional insight of, what is the threat actor likely to find first or or what set or subset of this information are they likely to put in the crosshairs the other thing is <clears throat> um and again this becomes interesting when you start mixing it with data that only you had access to like inventory data but because if the part of the point of this program is to say well we already have bookkeeping for things on the inside or we have decent inventory for things that are like applications that are on prem and our data um, data centers and you know we're we've got vulnerability management watching those things and things like that but what about all the things that you don't know about or maybe vulnerability management doesn't have the permission to monitor these things because they're hosted within third party environments and things like that <clears throat> so what i say is so easm is continuously looking for your unknown unknowns. That's what I like to call these, these assets. I also noticed it's what a lot of other companies like to call it, which are the ones that, so starting at the beginning, maybe your known knowns would be the ones that I just said vulnerability management knows about, right? They know they're out there, they're on top of it, they're doing what they can to protect them. 
you know, they've got Qualys or whatever watching it and everyone's sleeping pretty good about those because they feel like we'll get the alerts or the notifications if something goes wrong or, you know, if there's a vulnerability that we need to fix. <clears throat> then you've got your known unknowns, which are the ones where you say, well, we know it's out there. Um, we put it in, you know, that third party hosting environment or something like that. But unfortunately, we can't watch it because it's not ours. They said we can't do that. They don't want us scanning it or whatever. So it's out there, we, but we can't keep tabs on it like we can with the, the known knowns. Okay. <clears throat> well, ESM usually can help you with this too um, because they probably could get better visibility on it than your other solutions can. So that's a place where this can help you. But the real value, I think, is the unknown unknowns, the ones that Honestly, you just have no idea they're even out there, unfortunately, but it's true. And like I said earlier on another slide, I've had companies I've worked with where 50% of what we found, they said they didn't even know it was out there. So it was an unknown unknown. They had no idea it even was exposed on the internet. <clears throat> it's quite a real problem, unfortunately. Um, when you ask them, well, are you able to find it? Now that I've told you about it, can you like dig up information on it. A lot of times they'll come back and say it wasn't registered. It wasn't in the inventory. It just got put up, you know, deployed somehow. And we have no idea how that happened. We don't even know who is the owner of this. <clears throat> of course, these are all very concerning things to hear, <clears throat> but it, it happens. Um, but EASM can find these things for you. And like I said, give you ideas about how easy was this to find? How likely is it that someone else has already found it? They can usually tell you if, if they have um, vulnerabilities or at least give you an, an, some context around that so that they could paint the picture of, you have this thing out there, you weren't aware of it. It's been kind of like dangling for a while and here's the current state of it. Give you an idea of what you should probably do about it. <clears throat> That's, in my experience, this is where the ESM, EASM uh, pro program or service is bringing value to a security program that you're not already getting somewhere else, right? You're not getting this from vulnerability management. You're not quite getting this from threat intelligence. It's a unique um, value add from this function, which is why it's so important. Like I said, the fact that it allows you to see things through the adversary's lens and find these things that you didn't realize were dangling out there. Okay, <clears throat> so I also get lots of people asking me, but where, if we want to create one of these programs, if, we, if we're not doing this yet, which lots of companies are not yet, uh, you know, they don't have like a formal or mature ASM program yet, people ask me, where should I put it? Like, should I stick it under vulnerability management? Should I make it its own function that's independent like the others? Or you know, would it just be easier to stick, put it in a traditional uh, function that we already have operating and we can just extend it or add a couple of resources to it? I have tried it all, honestly. I've put this, I've put ASM under existing functions like vulnerability management, um, like threat intelligence. I've even had a, com a customer try to get us to put it under threat hunting which honestly, I'll tell you, didn't work too good, or I wasn't really satisfied with how that came out. But <clears throat> uh, I've, I've successfully built these under vulnerability management. I've successfully put this under threat intelligence. So you can do that. I would say if you have control over how you're creating one of these programs, I would say don't do that. Um, not because it won't necessarily work, but you're probably due to things like just siloing politics, the way that these um, functions tend to work with each other, just the fact that they're all going to be looking at their success criteria and what they see as what they're really there to be doing. And unfortunately, none of it really matches perfectly with ASM. If you're going to uh, run an ASM program and you want to get full value out of it and you want all consumers of the data to be getting the data uh, say the way they need it, 
you really should have ASM running as its own function, <clears throat> similar to how you have you know CTI running as its own function. So that way, there's direct relationships between the function and the consumers of the the intelligence or the information. Like I said, you, I'm sure you can pull it off under a traditional function if you really have to. I've done it, but I wouldn't recommend it if you if you can avoid it. <clears throat> The big, the big piece being the direct communication that so much of operating or, or executing one of these uh, functions is it's actually these days it's, it's getting easier to collect the data it's i would argue assuming you can afford this this isn't really that hard i mean even if you can't afford it so to speak and you've just got some of the tooling that i'm demonstrating for you you can get started with this on the cheap but you still have the the harder job, I would argue, assuming you're in a decent, you know, medium to large size company of communicating all this correctly across your security program when people aren't used to using utilizing it. <clears throat> so it's it's new information, it's new um say concerns for them to be taken um, into account. And it, it can take time to deal with the cultural changes, right? All right. So one thing I wanted to cover too is, <clears throat> you've probably noticed so far, um, everything I've been showing you is infrastructure focused, right? And this is uh, Forrester's definition of ASM, which actually I think is is pretty good. But it also, if you're, you know, if, if you're not say abstracting what, it, what it's saying, it's also pretty, infrastructure focused i would i would say or to a, you know that's what it feels like when you're reading it but i would say this is actually a pretty good um description the only thing it's missing is uh and you know i think it's important at least for your easm program that it has that ability to say but what does what do we look like from the red right or from the attacker's perspective this is that's been kind of left out here, but I, I think that's a pretty important um, benefit to having such a program. The other thing it it infer, you know gets you thinking when you read this is that it's like it says IT asset state, right? So it makes you think IT infrastructure. But I um so next slide. <clears throat> but my question that you know I I'm actually having fun. With this discussion, uh, I had a great time talking with people about it actually at uh, DEF CON this year. Is but should that be the scope of your ASM program or EASM e program? And uh, in my opinion, after doing this for a while, I would say no, you know, definitely no. Uh, but not everybody agrees with me on this. Actually, it was, it was an interesting discussion um, I had with a lot of people, but I think. There's other types of assets that are exposed on the internet and they can all pose security risks to your organization. I don't think we should be leaving those things out. Now, some of these additional asset types that some people don't think of when they think ASM could still be considered IT assets. So there, it doesn't mean that say Forrester's description is that far off, but I think it also could extend to things like uh, information about executives that work for the organization and their social media presence. It could mean uh, things like account credential leakage, right? Which could be considered an IT asset, but uh, I think people tend not to think about it or they're quick to forget about it. Um, it could mean brand reputation. So what, what, what does that mean? I, I can give you an interesting example where <clears throat> let's say you decommission a, a printer or something like that, and it has a cert on it with your company's domain name in it. Uh, so you decommission it, you, for, you don't wipe it you know, properly, it makes it through the decommissioning process with the cert still on it, and it gets sold somewhere and now it's out of your hands. So now <clears throat> it pops up somewhere on the internet and it says it's yours, right? Or at least if people are, scanning and they're looking at these assets, it's going to show up and tell someone this belongs to your organization. The truth is, of course, it doesn't. It's not yours anymore. The property, it's not your property anymore. 
but it still has your name on it. To me, that's a brand reputation problem. You, you've got something out there now that's going to make you look bad uh, and it's out of your hands. <clears throat> But you can't these days, especially you can't afford to just leave it there or you shouldn't because things like uh, security scorecard or or bit site are going to find it and they're going to say you have this, um, you know, asset out there that hasn't been patched in who knows how long and uh, it's part of but it's part of your organization and so we're going to bring your score down. I mean, and this is a real problem you could have people judging you and, and criticizing your due diligence because of this mistake that was made. These are things that also should be watched carefully and, and considered, I think, as part of the uh, ES, EASM program, forgive me. Um, you know, things like brand protection should be in scope, so to speak, of the program, or they should be working closely with other people that are, are dealing with this. <clears throat> So there's, there's all sorts of uh, things that are out there that you're gonna find with the, the e, uh, ASM program. And you really should be contributing, like I said, to making sure that the information is getting to the right people who can do something about it. Or if you don't have those people in your organization, then maybe the ASM program should pick up the responsibility because it's, it, it's doable, especially if you have the right vendor that can help you do these things um you know, like you can outsource a lot of these activities or you know additional efforts so something I, the reason i put this in there is <clears throat> actually so let, let me move to the next slide so at this um event i was at back in august so this was the um attack surface management panel discussion at the recon village for DEFCON this year. And the host was um, Nahamsek over here to the right. And actually, I thought it was great to hear him say that, you know, he thought we need to be maybe broadening the scope of ASM. And I agreed with him. You know, I, I, because I was actually already sold on that. I was, I was um, thinking something very similar, right? So that was my response on the panel discussion. But I also, uh, while we were there, announced to all the people listening that the Amass project is going to extend the scope <clears throat> or the definition of attack surface in 2023 because, because of how serious I think this is, that we, we need to make sure that we're watching everything that is relevant to the company, but it's outside of the company, so to speak. It's on the internet but it's potentially impacting their security. So it was an interesting uh, question that came up, you know, kudos to uh, Ben for raising the question at, at, on the panel <clears throat> or at the panel discussion. And it definitely got an interesting response from the crowd because again, I don't think everyone feels the same way about this, but I think most people were on board with the idea that currently the scope has been too narrow for this function. So I'd be interested in hearing what anyone thinks about this um, during questions and answers and things like that. But my personal position on this, and like I said, from years of doing this is we need the broadened um, definition. So <clears throat> future directions, this is pretty brief. So we're, we're closing on this. So where are we taking this project? Obviously, as you can see from the demonstration, it has a, I'll call it focused use case, you know, like <clears throat> there's so much room to expand this project and what we're doing uh, within this project. If only we had, you know, more, more time, right? But step number one is <clears throat> we're definitely gonna be uh, like refactoring the data model for this tool to in in include not only that extended definition of attack surface, but also everything we're collecting about these uh, assets. So you, I showed you the, the JSON file earlier where, you know, you saw what this tool currently can produce. Well, between the JSON file and the visualization, you know, you got an idea of what this uh, is collecting about the attack surface. In my opinion, 
it's not enough. It, it was an, it's been a great starting point and we've helped so many people from what I understand and what I continue to hear from the community. <clears throat> but I think there's so much more we can do. And I've also heard the community, you could say scream for this or, or ask for this in the discussions on Twitter and in the discord. And, you know, there's, there's interest definitely around this idea of we need a, a, a wider, broader, uh, say that you know um picture right more holistic picture of the organization's attack surface <clears throat> so we're going to do that we're going to expand the the data model we're going to in increase the, en the enrichment data the metadata that we're collecting on these uh, assets we are going to add tracking okay so guy raised this question earlier and i told him Make sure you poke at me if I don't uh, address it later. <clears throat> we're going to make it so that if anyone were to look at this data and say, well, how did that, how did you get that? Or, or where did that come from? Instead of saying, well, we're not sure. And you're going to have to like validate it yourself. The MS tool is going to collect the data of where exactly did this come from? All the way from where, where did we begin? And what was say the, the, the path that led us to the answer or to the finding <clears throat> so that you can see every step of the way, what was it that brought us here? So that someone could, uh, as Guy said, triage this and, and make up their own mind. Is this accurate or is there a false positive here or a mistake that was made or, or is there something out there uh, on the internet that's creating confusion about this? Because it happens, I've, I've seen that happen as well. And it can give you uh, places to go address these things, right? When you have the the trail of what what allowed you to find uh, these assets <clears throat> or su supposed assets, um, we're going to be attaching confidence levels to what we're finding. I mean, there's there's definitely places uh, on the internet where this information is more reliable than others, but that doesn't mean we're gonna that we're not going to use all of the information. It's just that we're going to uh, recognize which sources are more reliable than others. And we will factor that in when we're providing the, the results and we'll allow a user to say, well, look, I can only afford to be told about things that you have 90% confidence of, of or greater. Um, but maybe someone else is like, well, 70% 70, 70 sounds fine to me. <clears throat> we're going to allow them to, to decide instead of um, think for them in the tool and um we're gonna we're gonna make it so that right right now the mass engine is scriptable very very similar to like nmap where and i i think i mentioned this earlier so anybody can create a script access new data sources that we don't already have the implementations for and uh make greater use of this tool it's, it's like a framework essentially or an engine is what we call it. So, but I, I think we can do better to make this even easier, like make the scripting uh, so that it's easier for people to write the scripts and so that the scripts are capable of more advanced interactions with the assets on the internet so that we can do more with these scripts and we can make it easier for people to write them. And that's one of my goals uh, for 2023. I am open to anyone's ideas right now about what they think it would take to get there. Um, so if you have op opinions about this, I would say, let me know on the discord um, soon, but <clears throat> I'm thinking we're, pr we're probably going to change the language as much as I love Lua <laughs> personally, I don't see everybody else saying the same thing. Um, I'm leaning in the direction of we'll change it to JavaScript. So if you don't like what I'm saying, I, like I said, come to me and beg me not to do it. Um, but that's what we're thinking right now. And we're also going to do, um, we're going to start using a document oriented, oriented database for a couple of reasons. One is the, the database we use right now is graph based or it's a graph oriented database and it's no, nobody can use it really unless they're using it through the tool. Like there's no way to just directly uh, communicate with the database and like run your own queries or do what you want to do with it. 
it's very closed, but we're going to change that. We're going to use a document oriented database. We're going to make it easy for people to access it. And we're going to make it scalable uh, so that if you want to run this in your organization and you have a large organization and you need a lot of data to be collected, that it will all be very doable. <clears throat> Whereas right now, I would say it's not, or, you know, the, the tool has limitations. So those are our uh, goals or the directions we're taking the, the project. And that's what I had to share with you tonight. Questions. And hopefully, uh, Guy, you're not too upset that I'm 15 minutes over, but. <clears throat> oh, no, oh, we're good. There was um, a question. Um, someone, um, I think it was Garth. He asked about interested in, in ensuring passive versus versus active. Uh, I don't know. If you're still on, can you, uh, Garth, can you, can you jump on and explain that? Sure. Um, so can you hear me? Yes, we can. I can. Okay. I don't want to talk for minutes to, to my cat here. Um, so uh, I, I guess the, I, I the, the, from from um, either a, a red team example, looking externally at uh, targets, attack surface, um, and the blue team, you really don't want to let them know that's going on because then they'll just you know drop your IP and things like that. And I, I guess my paranoia is is when I'm executing a command, what elements of it will be doing active reconnaissance versus passive? And how can I ensure that that I'm I'm completely in passive mode? <clears throat> Fair question. So the default behavior for the tool <clears throat> is that um, the only, and I'm not, I mean, this, this gets, uh, debatable i suppose whether people consider this passive or active the only active um methods that are used 